we are in a series uh, about the character of God. And, uh, and we're looking at a few things um, that are helping us, and we're calling it, What's God Like? What is God Like? And this is, uh, this is a study we're going to stay in for a few weeks because we need to know uh, the character of, of our God if we're going to trust God. We need to know who he is, what he's like. God is, is not an unknown, unsearchable, unfindoutable entity. There are parts of him that, that we won't know until we get into eternity and then beyond. But what we need to know about his character is written down. And for us to uh, understand what his character likes, is like gives us confidence to have faith in God. Like Jesus told us, have faith in God. We're supposed to have his faith. Another version says, have the faith of God. How does God believe? He, he has no doubt. We, we can trust God without any doubt. And we got to know the character of God to walk into that place. So uh, I told you this last week that, that over the next few weeks, I'm going to be knocking over some sacred cows, meaning that all of us have had in times of our life, we've had things in our life that we have held on to that were religious beliefs, religious standards that actually aren't rooted and founded in the Bible at all that need to be knocked over and knocked out of the way so that we can believe what the Bible says and not just what brother or sister so-and-so told us 30 years ago. And so if I don't challenge these ever, then you'll continue to have this belief system that leaves you short of the expectation that God has for us in scripture. And so uh, my job is to kind of bring out truth and make you think challenge your belief system. Amen. Um, and that's, that's part of what we do on Sunday mornings is we challenge, we equip, sometimes we correct, and we definitely encourage because I don't want you to leave, uh, beat up. We've all been in church services like that. You leave and like, I might not even make it to heaven, let alone the car in the parking lot. But I want you to, I want you to walk out of this place and go, man, I got some stuff to work on, but man, I'm encouraged that God's with me and he's for me. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at a few more things. Uh, Last week, we talked about the phrase, God is sovereign, and uh, we believe that when it's defined correctly, that God is above rank, and he's above authority. There's no one above him. He is all-powerful, amen? But we do not believe God is sovereign, and he does anything he wants to, and all the good and the bad in this world is all attributed to God. That is not true. And so I don't have time to preach that message again. You need to listen to last week's, but this is important. We have this true picture of who our, our Father is, Amen. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to salvation and eternal life. That means he's not sending anybody to hell. He wants them all to go to heaven. People are choosing hell over him, unfortunately. Our job is to let them know, hey, that's not a good choice. Try this one instead. Amen? We talked about um, submitting to God and resisting the devil. That that, uh, if we're going to, if there's things in the the world that God tells us, that, that come, good and bad, he says things that are of God, we're supposed to submit to. Things that are of the devil, we're supposed to resist. That means not everything that comes is of God. So we got to recognize, is this from God or not? Now, religion says that there's a lot of stuff that's from God that's not from God. We got to find that in the scripture, amen? It's easy to discern because the scripture rightly divides truth. Amen. Amen. So um, we're going we're gonna to look at um, a little bit of what the law uh, was prior to, to us coming into the, the, the age of grace, the church age. Right now we live in the last, what the Bible calls the last days. The last 2,000 years of human history is called the last days. That's what it was called. From when Jesus uh, resurrected, actually the day of Pentecost marked the beginning of the last days. Peter preached, he said, this is prophesied, that, that in the last days that they'll, the sons and daughters will prophesy, they'll be filled with the Spirit. And so we, since that day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago, We've been living in the last days. Prior to that, we were living in the age of the law. And this is the law that came from Moses. God came, brought through Moses. And the law had to come so that we could realize we need a savior. Amen? And so we're going to look at uh, how we're redeemed from the law. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> and we're going to be in verse, just look at verse 17. Verse 17. Now, Jesus is talking about how believers are salt and light in the earth and that, uh, you know, we're supposed to let our light shine before men. But then in verse 17, he makes a clear statement in Matthew 5. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
Jesus came to fulfill the law. Once the law was for fulfilled, it it no longer in its in its fullness, it no longer was a requirement for us. It was waiting for a savior to fulfill it. It was waiting for someone to fulfill it. That was Jesus. He's the only one that did it perfectly. The only one. When Jesus, he didn't come to destroy it, he came to show us that the law was the tutor to bring us to Christ. It was to show us that we could not be made perfect of our own righteousness. Now, the law was not written to the world. Did you know that? That the law wasn't written to the world? It was written to the people of Israel. God never expected the Gentiles to follow the law. It was a tutor. It was, a, it was showing the, the Jewish people, you can't get there of your own righteousness. The problem that we have in religious circles is the same problem they had two, three, four thousand years ago, is that once we get religion, we think we can do it. Oh, I got it. I got it. I can do this. Ten commandments, no problem. The Ten commandments are just the ones written in stone. There's hundreds of more. God gave them all. Hundreds. Yeah, 613. That's a lot. Try to keep track of everything you're supposed to do and not do. So the law was written to prove to human beings, I don't care how righteous you think you are, you ain't making it. You ain't cutting it. There is nobody that can do this except Jesus alone. And so Jesus came to fulfill the law. So while he's on the earth, Jesus is here on the earth. Jesus was not operating in the new covenant. He was foreshadowing, meaning he was showing them what it's going to look like in the new covenant, but he was fulfilling the law while he was here. He said that's what he was here to do. And so he's explaining and talking about how faith works and how, and the character of God. And, and he's showing them what it looks like in the, in the future. Like we get to see Jesus heal everybody that came to him. Every single scripture that talks about Jesus healing, it says, and Jesus healed them all. Or he went, or the Holy Spirit led him to one person and he healed that person. Amen. But the people that came to him, he, he, he didn't turn anyone away. Even Gentiles, he tried to turn away. You remember the woman that came? There was a Gentile trying to get her, her daughter delivered. And, and Jesus is like, this isn't, for, this isn't for the Gentiles. You remember? Called her a dog, you know, ra- around the horn. And she, she hung in there. She got healing for her daughter. He came, he came to show the Jewish people, the people of Israel, what God's character was like to fulfill all this. But God never intended the Gentiles to fulfill the law, ever. Most of the people in this room, most of the people in this room are Gentile Christians. There's a few, you probably have Jewish heritage, right? But most of the people uh, in this room are of Gentile Christianity. So we, we came into this in the new covenant without fulfilling all the Jewish requirements. We don't have that uh, uh, two, two-headed monster, I guess, in our head trying to say, well, wait a minute, what about this? And then what about grace? And then don't we still have to do this in the law? And then, that's crept into the church over the last couple of thousand years to try to get Christians to go back into the law, trying to get self-righteous again. And you can't do it. You can't do it. We're not required to fulfill those anymore. The Ten Commandments are in the Old Covenant. Now, I'm all for having the Ten Commandments in places of public. I think it's a good reminder to the public that you aren't God. We aren't God. There's only one. But the covenant we fulfill under the new covenant is the covenant of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in those two, all the law is fulfilled. You're not going to violate God. If you love him, you're not going to violate your neighbor. If you love him, it's all fulfilled. Two, way easier than 613. Amen? So Jesus came to fulfill the law. So why we're in this is we're, we're looking at, we're, we're building case here of the character of God. He's dealing with people in this era, this age, differently than he did in the Old Testament, different than he did before the law, before Moses. It's the, it's the same God dealing with different eras of time based on the covenant he had with man in that moment. But God's character has never changed. Never He's the same. The Bible tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we have to do as Christians is recognize how are we putting God in a box in our life because of what we've seen in the Old Testament and how he dealt with people. 
Come on now, we're in the new covenant. We're in the new Testament. That means we do read the whole Bible. The Bible is there to give us a perspective and understanding of who God is and how God operates. It's there to show us that he works with people that are flawed and mistake riddled, and he still uses them for his glory. Amen. Amen? It's, it's supposed to be encouraging to see the progression of how man was and how, how, where we're at now. But for New Testament believers, we spend the bulk, the majority of our time in the New Testament because it's all about the new covenant and who we are in Christ. That's where we spend the majority of our time. There is huge, hear me now, there's huge value in understanding Old Covenant and they relate and they go back and forth. And that's why we go back and forth in the New Testament to see God is consistent and what he said would come to pass came to pass and who he is, he is now. We, we do this in our church, we go back and forth. But when we're looking at how we're supposed to live and, and, and function under the character of who God is now, we operate out of the new covenant, the New Testament. That's where we spend the bulk of our time. Everybody okay? Amen. So don't tear out your that last half of your Bible. That's not what I'm saying to do. Everybody clear? You need it. it there's so many connections that tie in how good God is. But when we're trying to figure out what we're supposed to do, in this age, in this dispensation, come on, the New Testament tells us how to be led by the Spirit and who we are in Christ and that we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Come on, these are all good things. And that helps us keep religion from creep, creeping in because we are not a bunch that is religious. We have a relationship with God. Amen? Amen? Okay, that's verse one. Okay, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. We're redeemed, redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. The law came and sin revived. One of, one of these scriptures says, the law came and sin revived. Why would God do that? Because before the, before the law, sin was not imputed. Sin was not added to the account of people. Before Moses, sin was rampant. It was happening all over the place. There was a reason why Noah, Noah built the ark. There's a reason. But before the law, sin was not imputed. It was not added to their account. But God still had to deal with it because it was getting out of control. It was so out of control, God could only save eight people out of a probable millions. Some historians believe it was two, three, four million people on the planet by the time Noah had the ark built. Well, when you live hundreds of years and your body's in good shape that whole time, you can have a lot of kids. And every time I say that, women go, how many kids is that? I don't know, but it's a lot more than you had. So people just multiplied like crazy. But because they, weren't, they didn't understand and have a, a law to help tutor, right? They didn't have a savior to help guide. Sin became rampant. And God was like, we got to start this thing over. That was the mercy of God on the human race. Because the way they were going, it was going to wreck everything. We'll talk more about that later. Turn with me to 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're building some case here. God is a good God. He's a God of good character, outstanding. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. I'm going to read this in the New King James, and then I'm going to read it to you in another version. It says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the law. If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, why would he call it the ministry of death? Because when the law came, sin revived and I died. That's the separation. When sin is alive and, and we know it's wrong and when we do it and it's written down and we, and we know it and we do it, then sin revives and we died. We were separated from God. The law showed us we needed a savior. God started counting the sins when the law came. It was a ministry of death. It was written and engraved on stones. It says, the Bible says that was glorious. 
How in the world? Because we needed a tutor to lead us to a savior. We needed to know that we could not do this on our own. Amen. So that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because the glory of his countenance, which, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? Come on, this is the, the, the ministry of the spirit we're in right now is full of God's glory. It's, it has more power than what the law did. Verse nine, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even if, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excels. For what if, for what, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Let me read it to you in the easy to read. Because some of y'all, your eyes will roll back in your head. Be like, where is he at again? I thought we weren't reading the Old Testament. No, that was all First Corinthians. Okay, easy to read. He made us able to be servants of a new agreement, the new covenant for himself to his people. It is not an agreement of written laws, but it is of the spirit. The written law brings death, but the spirit gives life. The old agreement that brought death written with words on stone came with God's glory. In fact, the face of Moses was so bright with glory, a glory that was, un, that was ending, that the people of Israel could not continue looking at his face. When you read the Old Testament, he, when he came down off the mountain, he was shining, his skin was glowing like glow in the dark tag like there's Moses found you like couldn't they couldn't keep looking at him because he was full of the glory of God just like uh, the tra transfiguration on the mount okay and and they couldn't they couldn't keep looking at his face verse 8 so surely the new agreement that new covenant comes from the life-giving spirit that has even more glory this is what I mean the old agreement judged people guilty of sin but it had glory so surely the new agreement makes people right with God has much greater glory. Are you following me so far? The old agreement had glory, but it really loses its glory when it is compared to the much greater glory of the new agreement. If the agreement was brought up to an end, came with glory, then the agreement that never ends has much greater glory. So what is he saying? The old covenant had glory. It had the hand and hallmark of God. But when that was fulfilled by Jesus, now we operate in the spirit and it's much greater glory. So the character of God is unchanged because he honored and fulfilled the old covenant and then he brought in the new covenant in Jesus. And this covenant that we operate in is full of grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. Are you guys with me? Amen. He's helping us. I mean, it, if, if, if you think it's bad now, you look at and, and research what it was going on before the days of Noah, it was bad, real bad. And Jesus said in the last of the last days, not just the last days, but right at the end, right before he comes back, it will be as the days of Noah. This is why we see so much going on. And God said, he's never gonna flood the earth again not going to do it. But there is a judgment coming and the Bible talks about that. He promised it would come. It would happen. And he, he, he clearly defines it in Revelation as the tribulation period. It is a judgment on the people and it is a judgment in the earth. And it is not because God is mad at people. He's upset with sin. He is trying to get people to wake up and see Jesus. The tribulation is truly the mercy of God. It really is the mercy of God on the humanity that's left to turn their face to God, to realize this is not good and I need help. It, it's always been like that. Noah preached for 120 years while he was building the boat. He was a preacher too and a boat builder and told them the, the judgment is coming. You need to honor God. And people mocked him and made fun of him, just like they're mocking and making fun of preachers now. But the mercy of God is in this age to lead people to repentance. And we still have a job to do. Amen? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So when it talks about the condemnation, it says the old, the old covenant brought condemnation. But in Romans 8, the Bible tells us, God tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So under the old covenant, 
God was still operating under, under, the, under his character, but in the old covenant, there was condemnation for doing wrong. It was, it was, you did wrong and you should feel bad about it. You need to fix it. You need to get right. Under the new covenant, we've been made right because of Jesus. And because of that, we don't have condemnation anymore. We have something called conviction. And those are two very different words. Conviction means you did wrong and you need to fix it. Condemnation means you did wrong and you're supposed to, you're, I'm making you feel bad about it. Condemnation comes from the devil. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. God is not making you feel bad for the dumb stuff that you and I have done. Thank you, Lord. There's conviction to make it right because we've been made right through the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we got to walk this out. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Okay, now let's look at how God deals a little bit differently. You got you take a little more? Go to 2 Kings with me. Let's go back in the in the Old Testament. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter one. Chapter one. Now God is is working through prophets here. 2 Kings. Chapter one. I hear pages turning. I love it. Love it. All right. Page, chapter one, verse one. All right, here we go. Uh, Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now, uh, Ahazi, I fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, go inquire of Beelzebub, sorry, I keep saying Beelzebub, but it's Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Now that is not God. Baal is the the God of demonic worship. And so he he is asking this God uh, to find out. Actually, my margin says uh, the Lord of the flies is what Beelzebub means. Why, why you would ask him, I have no idea. But um, Ahazi was the son of Ahab, Ahab and Jezebel, right? You remember the, that king and queen combo? Yeah, wicked, evil, not good. They get wiped out. Ahazi is the son. He comes in and now he's king. And he falls through a portion of his roof through the lattice and he's injured. He's like injured badly. And so it lo- it's not looking good. And so he asks messengers to go to Beelzebub and ask if he's going to die from this. So wrong God, bad idea. Sent messengers to them. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite. Now Elijah's still alive. Ahab and Jezebel, they died just like God promised they would in the same way God said they would. It was prophesied. But Elijah's still around. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise and go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, it is it." Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed. And when the messengers returned to Ahazi, they said to him, why have you come back? It was too soon. They they didn't have enough time to go where he said and come back. Why are you back? And they said to him, a man came to meet us and and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, it is because there is no God in Israel that you are sending uh, to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron. Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then he said to them, what kind of man was this who came up to meet you and told you these words? Elijah had enough authority to stop the messengers on their mission from the king and, and they, they understood uh, that this was the, a message from God, they, not the one they were supposed to go seek, but this was a man of authority. And they went back without finishing their mission to give the message to the king. And the king was like, who was this? What kind of man was this? He asked this question. Who, who was this that came to meet you with these words? And they said to him, it was a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. Apparently... Elijah was making such a fashion statement in the day (laughs) that just by that, the king says, that's Elijah the Tishbite. No, that's Elijah. 
Nobody else looks like this guy. Some say his beard could have been past his waist at this point. Just hairy dude wearing a belt. That's Elijah the Tishbite. What kind of fashion statements are we making? Okay, here we go. Then the king sent to him, uh, sent to him Elijah, a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him and there he was sitting on the top of a hill and he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. Now, what you've got to look at a little bit here is a little bit of defiance from King Ahazi. He is, he is not receiving the word of the Lord. Now he wants Elijah to come to him. He sent 50 soldiers, not messengers, soldiers to go take him if necessary by force to bring him back to the king. And they're telling him, this is a demand, come down. And Elijah answered and said, captain of the 50, if I'm a man of God, let their fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and the 50 men. So that should tell you right away, this is a man of God. Now, apparently they're, they are within earshot of someone else because this story is going around very quickly about what happened. And, and they're consumed. Then the king sent to Elijah another captain of 50 with his 50 men. And he said to him, man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. This guy's even more urgent than the first. And he knows what's happened to the first. And he's still adamant and defiant. Now he's saying, get down here. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and the 50 men. This is getting a little edgy for the next group of people. And again, this, this king is what we would call hard-headed. Modern term, knucklehead, okay? Not getting the clue. But it's not him, it's his, he's, he's just sending people out to die. No big deal to him. Again, he said a third captain with his 50 and his 50 men. And, and that ca captain of 50 came and went up. And this, this captain fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to him, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Smart. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him and do not be afraid. So he arose and he went down with him to the king. And then he said to the king, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, is, because there is, is that because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And Ahazi died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Be, uh, and, 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 and we read scriptures like this in the Old Testament, in the old covenant, and we're like, see, see, fire, fire is going to come down. Fire might consume you. You better watch out. You better, you better mind your P's and Q's. You never know what God is going to do. This is old covenant. Now, when we look at this, when you read this, you look, Elijah didn't have to call fire down from heaven. He actually didn't have to say that at all. He was anointed by God. And the, the kind of the arrogance and the brashness that came at him the first time, come with us. King said, you're coming with us. He is able to, because of his position, he was able to tap into supernatural things. Not everybody was doing this. Elijah the Tishbite was a well-known, well-recognized person. God had protected him. And then we know after, you know, 70 or uh, sorry, 102 people died. The captain in his 50, it's 51. After those two groups, 102 people died. One came humbly to him and he, the angel of the Lord said, go with them, you'll, you'll not be harmed. He, it's possible had the first guy come humbly that, that he would have just gone and been protected. Amen? Amen? So now go over to Luke chapter nine. Whew, how are we out of time already? Luke chapter nine, let me show you this and then we'll, we'll pick this up next week. Luke chapter nine. Jesus, is in, he's in old covenant. He's fulfilling the law. He's foreshadowing New covenant stuff. Luke chapter nine. Go to verse 51. This is, this is Jesus. 
and he's going through the area of Samaria. And it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he set, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face and they went and they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Jesus had been in Samaria before with the woman from the well. And, they, and, and, and because he told her things that no one else knew, and that he couldn't possibly know, other people knew, he couldn't possibly know, the village came out and received him gladly. And, and he was able to preach to them the kingdom of God. Do you remember this story? But now he's in another area of Samaria, which surely, surely heard the news about Jesus, who ministered and healed and, 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 and preached to Gentiles. Jesus led by the spirit to do that. Now he's in Samaria, the area, not the town of, but the area. And this town rejected Jesus. Why? Because his face was set to go to Jerusalem. When he was there ministering outside of, of uh, uh, a feast and he was there intentionally just for them, they received him. But in another town, when they knew that's, that guy's a Jew and he's not here to stay, he's actually going to Jerusalem, they rejected him. They rejected him because of the cultural and the racism that was going on in that time. They knew he was a Jew. They had no part with Jews. And they didn't want Jesus in there. And so they rejected him. And his disciples, verse 54, James and John said, saw this. They said, Lord, do you want us to come fire to come, command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? So they're, again, they're going back. They have scriptural precedent to do this, the rejection of the things of God, the rejection of the Messiah. Those first captains were rejecting uh, Elijah's anointing as God's prophet and, and, a, and a voice from God. They were commanding him to come at the order of the king without humility, like the third captain did. Are you following me? So they have precedent to go after this. Shall we command fire to come down? And Jesus said, watch this, but he turned and rebuked his disciples and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are. For the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Amen. So he's foreshadowing why Jesus came to the earth. He's fulfilling the law. And, and he set his face to Jerusalem because the time of his offering had come and he had to go and be crucified and raised from the dead. And because of that, He's no longer destroying men's lives. He's saving people. We live in the age of Jesus, our Savior, saving people, not destroying them. Amen. And that means the character of God is still intact because he had to deal with Old Testament people different than he did with New Covenant, New Testament people because Jesus is alive and well on the throne. Amen? Amen? And so when we look around and we see bad things happening, we cannot be in the bunch of Christians that says, ah, see, that's God judging them. That's fire falling down from heaven. You better watch out. You walk in the doors, you're gonna burst into flames. That's not how God is dealing with people now. It is through grace and mercy in the shed blood of Jesus that was sprinkled on the mercy seat before the throne room of God that God sees humanity through. And his grace and his mercy is on us. And it is more long suffering than we would ever be. Thank God for that in our lives. But come on, we can't get religious and think we got it all figured out and, and the, looking for the condemnation and the, and the judgment of God on everybody else that doesn't have everything figured out like you do. That's religion. That stinks. It smells bad. We got to get that out of our lives. He was merciful with us and he's being merciful to the world right now. Why? He's long suffering with the world so that by some means, these people would see they need a savior, repent and turn and make Jesus Lord of their life. And, I, and I'll say it again. He waits way longer than we would. I mean, we, were, we write people off at, at the turn of a hat. I mean, you, mess, you, you wrong me once, you're out. We, you ain't over for family dinner. You ain't over. I don't even want you in my, on my lawn. That's, that's how humans work. God is, he is long suffering, long suffering. Amen. And so we've got to be people of grace and mercy that knows that God is not willing that any should perish, but his character is still intact because he's, he is operating in, a, in an attitude of mercy because of what Jesus did in this era. Amen. And we're going to see more of this because the disciples, again, they had scriptural precedent. Let's call down fire. Jesus is like, you have no idea what spirit you are. Come on. I came to save men's lives, not destroy them. Where our job 
is to be in the community telling people that Jesus is alive and well, that God has reconciled them back to himself. That means he's made you right. If you'll receive Jesus, come on, it's easy. Follow him, amen? amen. That's our job. So the more we see this, the more we'll understand God is not mad. He is not angry. He doesn't like sin. He doesn't like the stuff that's going on, but he sees it all through the, the, the rose, the glass of Jesus standing in for all of humanity so that he is long suffering that some, by, by all hope and grace, some would come to say yes to Jesus, even if it was their last breath. That's his hope for us. Amen? Amen. But make no mistake, judgment is coming. He wrote it down. It's coming. Right now, we're in the age of grace. You guys okay? We got to shake this religion off so that we can function in the truth of the gospel. And that's the, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, not the fire and brimstone, not the judgment and anger of God. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Amen? And they got to know God is good. He loves them. Amen. Okay, there's more to say but that's gonna have to wait till next week. So just hang on and keep coming, amen? Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. Thank you, Lord, that you're showing us your character. You're showing us that we live in such a wonderful time, the age of grace and mercy. Help us, help us to convey that message clearly and concisely to the people that are in our circles, that you are good, you are gracious, that you love them and that you have come to save them and to deliver them. Thank you, Lord, that the gospel means the good news. And the good news is we don't have to do this on our own. The good news is, is that sin's price was paid for. The good news is that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. And he died for us and you raised him from the dead so that we could walk with you and be reconciled back and be put back in right standing with you. That's good news. Help us, God, to see that clearly like never before. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning and you have not received Jesus, the good news of the gospel is you can. Come on, the Bible says if you'll repent, if you'll turn from your wicked ways, if you'll, if you'll humble yourself and believe in Jesus, if you'll humble yourself and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, that he'll come in and he'll be with you and he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. That is a promise. But if you haven't prayed that prayer, if you haven't made that confession of faith, you need to do that. That's something you have to do that no one can do for you. You, you can't get this by just being in church. You can't get this by just reading your Bible. You can't get this by watching Daystar. You can only get this by your own free will and saying yes to Jesus. So this is the invitation. We're gonna pray. We're gonna invite Jesus and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life, all of us together as a church. But if you wanna pray that prayer with us, the invitation is wide open and available for you this morning. If you wanna pray it with us, this is what I'm asking. Between you and me and Jesus, I'm asking you, just let me know. Put your Make eye contact with me or, or put your hand up and I'm gonna look around for just a minute and then we're gonna all pray this prayer together. Come on, you wanna do this? Maybe for the first time, maybe you wanna recommit. You've walked away from God, you know it, you wanna come back, say, God, I'm giving you my whole life. Thank you, Lord. I'm gonna look around. I see that hand, anybody else? You wanna make Jesus Lord of your life. He's good, he's faithful, he loves you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. So good, so good. Let's pray this prayer together. Let's pray it and mean it from our heart. Can we do that? Pray this with me. Father, I believe Jesus is Lord. He is your son. He came to this earth. He died for my sin. And God, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I'm asking you, come into my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. Make me brand new. Fill me with your peace, with your joy, and with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, you prayed that prayer. God did something brand new on the inside of you. Amen. Here at Westside, we're all about equipping believers to succeed in life and mature in Christ as they reach, win, and disciple others. And we want to help serve you in that mission in any way we can. If you made that decision to follow Jesus today, we have some free materials that we want to help jumpstart you in your walk with Christ. Just go to wcspokane.com connect and mark the box that says, I'm committing my life to Jesus. This is the best decision you could ever make. And we want to help you in any way we can. 
Have a blessed week and remember, Jesus is coming soon.